Hello everyone, my name is Justin Parks. I've been a demonstrator at Ancient Tech Day for probably about the last four years. Um, this time I'm gonna be joining you from my backyard. So sorry if it gets a little noisy. Um, typically when I talk at Polo Grande, I talk about archery, specifically prehistoric archery, because that's what I did my, my master's thesis on. So I wanted to take this moment to show you some of the equipment that I typically bring to the event and maybe talk a little bit about prehistoric archery and what it meant to people at Pueblo Grande. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's give you a quick tour. Okay, so for starters, the prehistoric bow, this piece of wood here, this is a replica from a, a bow recovered from the cliff dwellings in New Mexico. It represents the type of bow that would have been used here in the Southwest. It's a pretty normal, um, general type of bow. It's just made from a single piece of wood. It's typically called a self bow if it's made from a single piece of wood. And that curve you see is not built into the bow in any way. A lot of people typically think that I somehow seamed the piece of wood to make this curve. But actually what's going on here is the bow is really, really stressed. It started as a straight piece of wood. And as I built the bow, as I started to create the bend in it, the wood fibers became so stressed that they, um, the wood cells started to crush. And as they crushed, they, they couldn't really flex back to a straight shape and it took on that curve. So that's why you get that curve. Um, most of the bows that we see that survived over the thousand years, survived, you know, weather and rot and all these things, it's really rare to find wood. They typically have this curve. And that tells us something. It tells us that the wood they're using was really stressed, which means that their bows were really strong. And when you make these replicas, you see just how strong they really were. This particular one pulls 60 pounds, 60 pounds of force. And uh, most of the bows seem to be about that. And that's even more impressive when you see what kind of arrows they were using. And so prehistoric arrows, like this I'm pulling out my quiver here, are typically made of reed. And reed is extremely lightweight. It's like the carbon fiber of its day. So if you take that 60 pounds of force from a bow and you apply it to this really thin, lightweight arrow, it goes incredibly fast. They move about 160 feet per second, which is really impressive for Stone Age equipment, if you imagine. Um, so a lot of people, when they, when they start to see how this equipment was used, they'll, uh, they'll see these tiny, tiny little stone arrowheads, something like this. And they'll, they'll call these bird points because they're so small. You know, they imagine something, something big like this is what people are hunting with, you know, deer, elk, something like that. But actually this, if you're seeing something this large, is typically not even associated with the bow and arrow. This, this is more of a, uh, a dart point, something that would have been thrown on the end of a, a dart or a spear something that came before the bow and arrow. And when you get these small points, something even that small, these are what people were using on the ends of their arrows to shoot deer or uh, large game, anything like that. And they're not bird points, they're not rabbit points. If you're going after a bird or a rabbit, you're going after, after it with something like this, just a, a wooden point. Because if you can imagine an, a wooden point this large hitting a rabbit or a bird would be the equivalent of a human being hit by a telephone pole. And you don't really need the end to be sharp to, to make an impact on something that small. And if you're going after something large, you only need a little bit of cutting force to really puncture a lung or a vital organ. And especially if this little stone point breaks inside an animal, It'll cause a lot of damage, and the animal may not die immediately, but it will die. And so it doesn't really take that much force. Now, the other factor about why people aren't using little stone points um, on the ends of their arrows, there are some more examples. 
because stone points are made from very fragile stone. So if you miss, you're probably not gonna be able to use that point again. It's going to explode. You know, points are typically made of, of things like flint or obsidian. And obsidian is essentially glass. And if you hit a rock with that, it's just going to turn to dust. And so you don't wanna spend all that energy making a point just to have it explode from missing a, a really small target like a rabbit. So I'm gonna demonstrate just how these points are made as well to get you more of an idea of the, the type of equipment that was used in the prehistoric Southwest. Um, like I was saying, whenever a prehistoric hunter was going after a deer, they wanted to use something a little more heavy duty than just the, uh, the wood point at the end. Something that large is gonna need something more than just a sharpened stick. So they would typically add a, uh, a stone point to the end that can be really, really small. Something like that would be perfectly suitable to go after a deer. And so to make these, they're using anything that, any stone that looks almost good enough to eat, something really high in silica. So typically it's things like obsidian, flint, chalcedony, agate. These are all really good for stone tools because they allow you to direct force through the stone. I'm gonna show you what that means. So I'm gonna use obsidian for this demonstration. And obsidian, like this, comes from Northern Arizona. It was highly valued. It was traded all over the Southwest. And in order to use this, you have to first start by cracking into it. And uh, people typically use something called a hammer stone, which is just a nice stone that fits in your hand that you're going to use to, to drive off what are called flakes off the stone. And so I'm gonna show you that real quick. You can see the, the exterior of the obsidian looks kind of dull and gray, but the interior is really black. Um, and so what I just did is I essentially directed a cone of force. Most of that cone is going to dissipate out into the air, but some of it is going to hit and travel in through the stone. And if I get just a little bit of that, you can see how it essentially ripples through the obsidian and it drives off a flake of stone. So this is called a flake. And this is called a core. As if you're an archaeologist, this is kind of what you're looking for to see traces of the past. So if I were a prehistoric hunter and I was making my stone tools, I would first start by driving off these flakes, probably a few until I could get one that's nice and flat and thin. So something like that, probably a little thinner than that, but this is kind of getting to that point. And once I have a suitable flake, what I would then do is switch over. And if I were making a, an arrowhead, I would start by taking this flake and switching to what's called a pressure flaker. And the same sort of principle applies that I used for the hammerstone. It's just on a much smaller scale. So I'm going to first, I'm gonna just abrade this edge so it's not so sharp. And as before, I was striking flakes off with the hammer stone. Now I'm going to press tiny flakes off with the pressure flaker, which is the tip of an, a deer antler, something kind of soft so it can grip the stone. So all I'm gonna do here is take tiny, tiny little flakes, and you can see just these tiny little flakes that are coming off. And this does two things. It allows me to shape the stone into the triangular point that I want to make and it also creates a more durable edge. So obsidian on its own, when you flake it, it's flaking incredibly thin and basically down to a molecule in thickness. So it's super sharp. It's one of the sharpest materials that humans still know how to make, even in the space age. And it's typically used in things like eye surgery. But that edge is not very sharp or it's not very durable. So by doing this, it creates a more durable edge, more of a bifacial edge, kind of like a knife blade. So that allows it to be used uh, more than once. So as I do that, you'll see this just a little bit of nibbling. And I'm not so sure you'll be able to see it on the video, but you can try. Let's see that. 
by doing this, I end up with this bifacially flaked stone, which will look something like this. And this is your, your typical arrowhead and how it's made. It's just taking that piece of stone and just flaking back and forth on each side until you get the shape you want. And that's first off is uh, just how these bows are being made. Typically, people are starting with a, a three-quarter groove axe if you're in Pueblo Grande, which is just a cobble like this. The three-quarter comes from this groove that doesn't go completely around the axe. It just goes, you guessed it, three-quarters of the way around. And this is just a small river cobble that's been sharpened on one end to make that little bit of an edge there you can see. This would have been hafted in a handle, so just like a typical axe, you would have been able to wield it with a handle. Um, this is chopping down your sapling. Once you have it chopped, you might flip over to a chisel. This is an antler chisel. We know these were used in bow making because we found a couple associated with uh, burials of a bow maker. So there's a pretty good indication that these things were used quite a bit. Um, they show this kind of wedge shape or chisel shape on one end and these scars on the other from where they were hitting it with a hammer to drive off uh, splinters of wood. So that kind of gets you your rough shape. And after that, you would switch over to those obsidian flakes that I showed in my last video to, to use as a scraper to kind of drive off nice thin shavings. So other things on my table, I have a, uh, this is a point that was actually recovered from the Holcomb site. This is a, a cast of an original. All of my, uh, everything else on my table is a, reconstruction none of these are original artifacts so you can just see the uh, really impressive um, craftsmanship that went into some of these points this probably was not a functional point it may have been associated with a um, a ritual or, or <laughs> symbolic you know whenever archaeologists don't know what something is they call it ritual so this is just to say we have no idea why they were making these but they're impressive other types of points that we found in the Southwest, we've seen fossilized shark's tooth, shark's teeth, uh, at least in, at, in one context in New Mexico, someone shot a uh, fossilized shark's tooth on the end of an arrow, so that's kind of cool. Um, like I said, points can be made from a variety of materials. This is a petrified wood point. So it's agatized petrified wood, which allows it to be pressure flaked, like I showed, it has this really clean um, internal matrix, so you can kind of manipulate it into whatever force you want. The arrows are made with reed, like I said, and they also have a, um, a hardwood foreshaft on the end, so some other stick that you put in the very front of the shaft. That allows you to switch out whatever point you want and keep the rest of the arrow intact. The feathers are attached with sinew. So this is the tendons of a deer leg, which become really pliable when you get them wet. And that's what this is here. This is a tendon. So if you pound this up, it turns into a fiber like this. And you can turn this into your, um, your bowstring. So you can see that this has been twist it up into an actual cord so that it becomes really high in tensile strength. And if you get it wet, like I said, it becomes really pliable. And you can wrap your feathers with it. And this is this is an old arrow, so I'm sorry, it's a little raggedy. Um, as that sinew dries, it'll shrink and it'll pull the feathers together. So it's very, very useful. Like the prehistoric duct tape of its day. Um, the only other thing I have on my table for today, since I don't have too much time and this is probably pushing it, is this barbed foreshaft. So this was recovered from an archaeological site, both in the Tonto Basin, so Tonto National Monument, and in the Verde Valley. And you can see one of these at the Verde Valley Archaeology Center. And there, you know, there's not too much known about what these were used for. These barbs could have been for a variety of things. People have proposed fishing poison. Uh, there's some evidence that maybe they were used for rodents to pull them out of their holes. But the answer is still, you know, very circumspect and unknown. 
Um, but they're very elaborate and very beautiful. So that's the only thing I have on my table. I'm glad you guys got to at least see me virtually. Um, hopefully I'll see you guys next year. Bingham Deutscher with Harmony Animal Behavior. I'm here at Ancient Technology Day for Pueblo Grande to talk about macaws in the ancient southwest. This is Ari, he's a scarlet macaw, and Max is a military macaw, and Ari and Max and I are going to tell you how macaws brought technology to the ancient southwest through the training routes. Parrots were highly revered in ancient society. They were almost magical with their flight, large size, brilliant colors, and being capable of human speech. Mesoamerica is the term anthropologists use when referring to Mexico and parts of northern Central America. Finding petroglyphs let us know that macaws were in the area in these ancient times. The remains of several hundred scarlet macaws and some military macaws have been recovered at archaeological sites in the southwest, as well as a few remains of thick-billed parrots. Skeletal remains, macaw eggshells, and imagery of macaws on ceramics suggest that macaws played an important role in exotic trade items for rituals and decoration. Besides the exotic items ancient people would bring for trading, Ideas of technology were exchanged through conversation and demonstrations. Recent radiocarbon dating of the macaw remains presents scientific proof that the exchanging of items of value and sharing technology ideas and techniques occurred hundreds of years earlier than previously believed. My daughter Jen Deutscher at Olithographica.com made this map to show us where macaws naturally lived. Scarlet macaws in the red areas, military macaws in the green areas, and the yellow dots at the top of the map are places in the southwestern United States where macaw products and macaw feathers and bones have been found. Scarlet macaws and also some military macaws were brought from their native tropical forests over 1,000 miles to the southwest desert. Ancient people traveled these distances on foot to and from Mesoamerica to the southwest, bringing colorful birds and feathers, copper bells, marine shells, and cacao, the plant form of chocolate, to trade for southwestern turquoise and pottery. This exquisite macaw feather sash is a perfect example of scarlet macaw feathers from Mesoamerica crafted into a special ceremonial garment. The colorful birds and their feathers were prized for ceremonies. The flying abilities of macaws were associated symbolically with the sun, lightness, and breath. Green and blue feathers represented rain and water. These birds held immense symbolic value, status, and were a colorful commodity. On their journey, the caretakers of macaws had to make great efforts to supply appropriate food and water for the birds. In the wild, these birds would eat seeds, nuts, berries, fruit, insects, vegetation, and tree bark. Evidence shows that the ancient people would feed the birds dried corn, which they would soften by pre-chewing and moistening in their own mouth before feeding the birds. It was often women who were responsible for the daily care of these valuable birds. Those who could handle the macaws and keep them alive and in good feather condition were highly regarded in society. Macaws may attach to one person and be very difficult and aggressive around other people. They are strong, fast, and have powerful beaks. Here Ari has no trouble cracking the hard shell of a Brazil nut. Macaws had a meaningful impact on the lives, social structures, and technology of ancient society in the American Southwest.
Ari and Mac I live with me, and they both came from homes that have not worked out. Please do your research before you get a macaw or any bird because they're actually very, very destructive and loud and messy. But they're also wonderful and intelligent. Hello, my name is Luis D'Angelo and I'm a recreation leader here at the Pueblo Grande Museum. Today I'll be showing you how the ancestral Otham tribe made their homes. The most common type of home the uh, tribe would make was known as a pit house. Uh, this was a small to medium sized one family home uh, that was constructed out of gathered plant materials and adobe. This style of house is popular until the historic period, so archaeologists were able to study their descendants' versions of these, the key, and mix that information with the information we've gathered from remnants of these ancient houses into a good idea of how they would have constructed these. Uh, first, they would have dug a shallow uh, base. This would mean that the floor of the inside of the house was about a foot or two below the exterior soil. Uh, this helps insulation. Uh, actually, in our replicas here, you can feel a good 10 degrees difference when you're inside the house due to the lower ev or elevation. Uh, second, they would construct a bare bones wood frame. This would have been made from wood materials like cottonwood or mesquite. And this would start out with large log supports and a uh, sort of out, or exterior frame made out of branches. And these branches and logs would be tied together using agave uh, cordage, which is made from the fibers of the agave plant. Okay. Uh, next, the frame is filled out with thinner branches and reeds. Uh, these can be saguaro ribs, uh, as I've used in my model here. Uh, it could also be choya branches or rough grasses. Uh, these are interlaced. You can see there's our wooden supports here. And then there's more mesquite on the exterior here uh, between the ribs and the uh, adobe. And then finally, of course, the exterior is coated in the adobe mud. That helps to finalize the insulation and protect the whole house from various desert uh, weathering. <laughs> now, adobe itself is a very important building material. Even up until the mid-1900s, people in Phoenix were using it to insulate their homes, but they tended to use it in a slightly different way. Here to tell you about one such method is our visitor service supervisor, Laura Andrews, with her adobe bricks. I'm Laura Andrew and I'm the Visitor Service Supervisor here at Pueblo Grande Museum. I get to show you how to make adobe bricks. So let's get our hands dirty and have some fun. In order to make adobe bricks, we're going to need a couple of things. First, you need to ask your parents if you can use dirt and a mixing bowl and some other materials that they have, but you have to ask first. Second, then you need to get, gather these materials. We need something in order to form our bricks, and at the museum, we use forms like this. You probably don't have something like this at home. So, idea, you can use butter dishes. They're really good, they're nice and small, they're a little bit tall, so that the bricks will be nice and firm. Or you can use sandwich holders. So these things you can get at home. Another thing you can use, you're gonna need some tin foil. And we have it wrapped around some cardboard. And this is for your brick to dry on. 
And it's important, you don't just want to use cardboard because your brick's going to be wet and it'll make soggy cardboard and no one likes that. So the foil helps give the cardboard strength. And you use this so you can let your brick dry and you can move it so it's not in the way. The next thing you're going to need is dirt. And dirt from the yard works, but once again, ask your parents if you can use some dirt from your yard. But the dirt will have rocks in it, so you will have to dig out the rocks. So you're going to need to go through your dirt and pick out the rocks because that'll make mixing a little difficult. Then these other things are kind of an option for you. Some people use hay or straw or they used uh, shredded paper. You can use any of these things or you can choose not to. It's really up to you. It's kind of fun. You get to experiment to see what the different different items will do to your brick. Something else very similar to soil or dirt is sand. And you can also use some sand. You won't use as much sand as soil, but it's another item that you want to gather. So once you have all of these things in place, we get to get our hands dirty and make some bricks. So you're going to want, these are just kind of a, like the party cups. You're going to want a cup of dirt and you're going to want it to be full. One cup of dirt will fill about one butter dish. So you pour that into your bowl or your mixing bin and then you're going to need water. Now, this is the trick. You don't want to put too much water, otherwise it'll just be a runny mess and it won't form a brick. So that's a little less than half a cup. I wouldn't use that much. I'd use just a little bit less. And you, you can remember, it's going to take an experiment to see what will work for you. So you use probably about a third of a cup and you put that in your bin. Now, this is completely up to you. You can dig in with your hands and get really dirty or you can use um, like a garden trowel. And if you use the garden trowel, you're going to mix the water into the dirt and you're going to make a mess. You really are. <coughs> At some point, the dirt is going to look kind of crumbly, almost like a crumbled up cookie. You're almost there. <coughs> Don't swallow the dirt like I just did. <laughs> so it's kind of crumbly, right? It's not too wet. This is when you can, if you can kind of make it into a ball, you're just about at the right consistency. So you make a ball, you get your butter dish, and you put it in the butter dish. And you pack it in. Just like with cakes, you don't want any air pockets. Okay, with the cake, you would kind of probably tap the dish on the table. With this, you got to get your hands in and push it down. All right, I'm going to move some of our stuff over to the side so you can see this better. This is where your tin foil comes in. Now, how are you going to get your brick out of this dish? <coughs> That's where I use the trowel because it kind of has a pointy edge. You have to be careful. You could use a knife, a butter knife, if your mom says you can or your dad. 
but you're gonna go around the edges. <coughs> Making sure that you go all the way to the bottom. If you only go a little bit, it won't come out fully. Push down, you can feel the difference. Once you do one or two of them, you'll understand what it feels like. <coughs> then you take your butter dish, flip it over. Tap three times, and then you have a brick. If it doesn't look quite perfect, you can mold it. Now that's a mound of adobe. What can you do with that? You need to let it dry before you do anything. Once it dries, it'll form kind of a little shape like this, and you can make bricks. And you can build things with them. Now, you don't just have to do the small shape, you can also do it on a big form, too. <coughs> but you need more dirt. So you can get more dirt. If you run out of cups, just use your butter dish. You can scoop your dirt, but then you have to kind of experiment with how much water you put in. <coughs> Pick out your rocks. So that's two butter scoops. Add water. You're gonna need a little bit more water than this. I'm going to add too much water so you can see what that looks like, okay? Because if you do it once, you'll understand what too much looks like. So we add the water, mixing it in. Oh, I'm just going to get my hands dirty here. This is a little different than what we had before. You see, it's kind of soupy. There's no way that's going to stay in one of those butter dishes. How do you fix that mistake? Well, it's not really a mistake. It was a happy accident. So you can get some of your shredded paper and you can mix it in. Like with any good recipe, you do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and it'll come out wonderful. So you mix it in and the water helps absorb, I mean the shredded paper helps absorb the water. Still a little messy. Hmm. Well, we can always add more dirt. Let's get some more dirt. Make sure the rocks are gone. Add a little more dirt. That's getting closer to what we want. It's still a little wet, but you can see it wasn't as runny as the others. So we're gonna use the big form and see if that makes a difference. There we go. We're gonna plop that in. And you still have to, on this, push down just like you did before. Make sure that all the holes are pushed out, all of the air. Now, we'll see if this one will stand up. It still has a little bit of extra water in it. You can see it on the surface. Just like with the butter dish, you kind of have to go around the edges. Now, if you don't have a trowel, you can use a stick or a piece of wood. Even a popsicle stick will work. And you go around the edges with it. And what that is, is it helps the dirt separate from the edge of your form. All right, we'll see if this one will stand up. See how the water's running out? That shows us that we used a little too much water. But you can always shape it up and you let that set in the sun. Takes about a day for it to dry out and for it to get nice and hard. 
like that one or like this one. So go out and experiment, see what works, what works best. Have a little fun and get your hands dirty. So let's go over again what you need to make your adobe brick at home. You need dirt, you need water, you need a form in order to put your dirt and water into. You need probably a trowel or a stick to help you cut it out of the form. But most of all, you need your parents' approval and you need to ask them if you can get some dirt and use these tools to have some fun. This is Laura Andrew, Visitor Service Supervisor at Pueblo Grande. My name is Charles Tadano, and I'm the president of SALT. SALT is a local group that really just enjoys making primitive items and working with the public. SALT stands for a study of ancient life ways and technologies. We've uh, formed here at Pueblo Grande, and uh, we've been uh, uh, part of their uh, monthly uh, e exhibits, and we really enjoy ourselves, and we hope that one of these days uh, Pueblo Grande will be open again so that you can come and enjoy and learn some of the different skills that I'm going to be showing you today. Now, what I'm going to be doing here today is uh, stone jewelry, but because of my passion for jewelry, I brought some other things to uh, show you. Uh, this particular item is made out of shell, but also juniper beads. Now, these juniper beads are unfinished. They were just collected, dried, and uh, then what would happen is they would pierce them and then put them on uh, cordage and you can see this beautiful piece. Now this shell is called glomiserous and this shell here is highly polished and uh, it's a very beautiful piece. Now this particular next piece is something that I saw at a museum, Mesa Verde Museum. It was a burial piece. It's no longer on display because uh, of the re repi, uh, of the, excuse me, the uh, uh, rep they had to return them anyway to the Native American tribes. But this particular uh, is also made out of ghost beads, but the ghost beads are, are uh, finished. Uh, the difference between these two, as you can see, the unfinished, which has the husk, and then these are the actual seeds. Now the neat thing about this, if there's 1,450 beads that are in this right here, uh, finished with some olivella and then some uh, uh, darker beads right here. This was uh, something that I saw and it, I, there was just a passion for that. The next item that I'm going to show, now a lot of you know that are familiar with this uh, ornamental Indian corn. Well one of the things that they also used to do uh, was uh, make necklaces and jewelry out of uh, some of the native seeds and things. So this is something that I saw at uh, Mesa Verde also and so I replicated that. Now this is olivella shell. Olivella shell is a shell that came from uh, uh, Southern California. So they, it was traded or they made trips, okay, to the California coast. And you can see it's very, very beautiful, highly polished. Uh, and then the, a lot of times they would uh, grind the glomiserous shell down on sandstone. And I'll show you that process very soon uh, until there was a hole. And uh, you can imagine how beautiful this was on the dark skinned Native Americans that were here. This is another variation, a multi-strand of olivella with the uh, glomiserous shell, okay, as, as decoration spread out throughout it. Another one that, I, once again, I saw at Mesa Verde. So a lot of these things uh, are replicas of what the Anastasi did. Now this is another, uh, this was found another Native American burial, which is no long, excuse me, it still is on exhibit at uh, Mesa Verde. And the neat thing about this, is there 5,557 Hishi beads that go into this right here. So uh, I'd like to say that I made the Hishi beads, but unfortunately trying to find the materials was a little harder and it was a little easier for me to go ahead and source the finished beads. But let me tell you, it did take a tremendous amount of time for me to go ahead and string those beads. Now, 
Here's what we're going to be doing. Here's what I'm going to demonstrate. It's called argillite. Now, argillite is a real is a sedimentary stone. It comes from the uh, uh, Prescott Valley area, uh, and it's really, really unique. Um, like a lot of, uh, it's got this great color, so there's a lot of iron in it, and uh, it grinds down really, really pretty. And at the same time, it's a beautiful piece. Okay, and it has it's very, very shiny, uh, and it takes a great polish. Now. The first thing that you want to do when you're going to, if you're going to be working the stone, is you want to find a stone that is very similar in size, thickness, and in shape to the finished piece that you want. A good example is like this gorget. If I wanted to make a gorget, another gorget, I'm going to try and find a stone that's thin. I'm going to try and find a, st a stone that's very similar in shape. That's going to save me a lot of grinding time and a lot of finishing time. And just like anything, like any workman, I'm going to want to do the things that are going to pr produce the result the very fastest that I can. Now, uh, one, uh, I've got a stone that's soaking in, soaking in water, and one of the reasons that it soaks in water is it's sedimentary stone. We add moisture to it to, uh, so that in the reduction process, it's just a lot easier. Now, one of the things, I'll show you how quickly this is. Oh, I forgot. We, uh, we're using a little bit of water and we're using sandstone. Okay, sandstone was a preferred method to uh, abrade things. And I've got a piece of uh, small argillite here. And uh, let's say I wanted to make uh, a shape very similar to something like this. Well, I would start off with this raw chunk right here. Now, the, uh, a lot of people, when you hear the word stone, a lot of people think it's going to take a long, long, hard process to go ahead and reduce it down. But I'm going to show you how quickly this thing reduces down. Now we can all see this little point right here, and I'm going to go ahead and wet up the stone a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and just grind. Now when you grind, you go in the same motion. And if you can see this, you can see the powder coming off of this. You can actually uh, see some of the uh, slurry falling into the water. And you'll notice that point's gone. Okay, so it reduces down very, very quickly. It's a real unique process. Uh, it's a lot of fun to do. Uh, you can find this stone uh, uh, if you go up around the Prescott area and, and you're in the Chino Valley area and, you, and you're in the right place. And uh, a lot of times I've actually found this stone uh, in uh, rock gardens and things like that because uh, uh, quarries will come in and then mine, mine this argillite and then bring it on down. It's a very, very pretty stone, so you can see how people with desert landscaping and things like that will want to use this to accent. So if you have a neighbor that has desert landscaping, take a walk. You might be able to find some argillite in their yard. Now, when you're working this argillite, it's a back and forth process. Uh, a lot of people, me, when I'm trying to teach classes here, will try and go in a circle or go in all different uh, directions. You don't want to do that because what's going to happen is you're going to put very, very fine scratches into the finish. And what that's going to do is when it comes time to polish, uh, you're not going to have a highly reflective surface like this right here. Uh, you're going to see all the swirls in that. Any time that you see the swirls, it takes the shine away from that. Now, so you're going to go ahead and just reduce it down as quickly as you can. And what I do is I, 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 I'll pick a number. Generally, my number is seven. I'll do seven passes on this side. I'll wash it off. I'll flip it over and do seven passes on that particular side. Now, this particular one right here would probably take me uh, about a half hour to go ahead and reduce it down as thin as I want it and to shape it. We don't, unfortunately, we don't have the time to do that. So I'm just going to give you some real, real brief uh, uh, procedures on what to do, and then hopefully one of these days you can come down to Pueblo Grande when we're the public's back, and we and we, you'll catch us here, and we can actually uh, show you what to do, and we'll be giving actually classes very, very soon, hopefully, on how to make argillite jewelry. Now. Um, I showed you how quickly it reduced down here. Uh, let's say that you wanted to uh, take your piece and you want it to be oval in shape. It's very, very simple on something like this right here. What I'm going to do is I just, as I bring it across, I'm just going to flick my wrist. And eventually, all those different surfaces that were angular are going to turn and be curved. And you can start to see 
that little curve in, right over here, just from me just doing that five or six times. So it's a very, very fast process. And don't, you know, if you try that, don't be, uh, don't be uh, timid and, and try not to do, uh, you know, try and stay with basic shapes. Uh, this is a replica of an artifact that a good friend of mine uh, in Texas, uh, when he was here before he moved to Texas, showed me. And uh, what he had, the turquoise was missing. And I knew that there was something that was, should have been embedded in there. So what I did was I got a piece of turquoise and I ground it down using the same process and I was able to go ahead and fit it in there. And you can see turquoise and Argolite were a very favorite combination and you can see why. It's just a very, very beautiful piece. Another thing that uh, Argolite also did, uh, they used Argolite on the glomisserous shell. And as you can see right there, the contrast between that was just, it was just a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. Now, here are some finished pieces that I have, or almost finished pieces, uh, as far as the shape. And a lot of these, uh, you know, the unique thing about uh, this jewelry and this particular stone is how you get the polish on it. Now, this particular one here, is like what you're going to see, some of these that I'm showing you right now, are what you're going to see on display inside Pueblo Grande Museum. And they have to remember that a lot of these things have been exposed to the element for hundreds of years. And so what happens is just like anything, uh, they're expo exposed to the sunlight and the moisture and the wind, and the finish wears off. And while they're beautiful pieces in unique shapes, you can see when they're polished, the difference between them. And here comes a really, really unique uh, story behind the polish. I was told by a good friend uh, who's Native American, uh, I was just producing pieces like this, basically unfinished pieces, because I was trying to replicate what I was seeing in Pueblo Grande Museum. And one day he came up and he looked at my display and he says, great pieces, Charlie, when are you gonna finish them? And I asked him, I don't understand what you mean by finishing them. And here's a little, here's a little secret that, and a little story that he told me. He told me that, let's say that I was the jewelry maker in the tribe, okay? And a husband came to me because his wife was going to be having a baby. And he was, going to, and he was the hunter of the tribe. So he came to me and he says, I'll trade you X number of rabbits and rabbit skins. I want you to make a pendant and for, that I can give my wife in honor of my newborn baby. And so he would, he would find out what shape, uh, uh, what size, take the order, produce the item, and then he would present the stone, unfinished like this, to the husband. Now the husband would then take that and he would take it to his wife and he could do one of two things. He could go ahead and put his essence in it Okay, so that and give it to his wife so that every time that she wore that particular pendant, she would be carrying his spirit around with him. Or they could both put their essence into it in honor of their child. So when the wife was carrying this around, she would have her husband's essence and her essence in there. Want to know what the essence is and what makes this shine? It's this human body oil. Now I'm going to rub it on both sides of my face. Now, if it was in the summer, it would be, oh, I'd, it would be a little easier, but just from doing this, can you see the difference? Okay, there's a tremendous difference between the two, and, and in this case, three. And what you do then, after you thoroughly coat it with your body oil, and various parts, portions of your face will have more body oil than others. The bridge of the, no, the nose, the forehead, the cheeks, and what you do is you rub it in. So with the friction and the pressure, you're rubbing in your human body oil into the stone. And after five coats, this is, this is what you're going to get. It's going to, it's a seal uh, on the fifth coat and then any additional coat that you put after that will just turn that into a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. And this is the, that's one of the reasons that I love doing the Argolite. You can make a lot of different shapes. Uh, gorget, simple oval, an elongated oval, a square. You can make some gorgeous rings out of this. And then you can also make smaller pendants, like what you see here, or a tube. Now these particular ones here, 
this is a particular, this one here is still unfinished. Uh, and because it's a, it's a really unique stone, I was showing you how I could rub it on my face and it'll change. I've been working, this has been semi-finished for about a year. Uh, I keep on applying my body oil, but for some reason this particular stone, uh, after about, it looks beautiful for about a week, but then because for some reason the body oil seems to get absorbed into the stone and uh, then it turns uh, back to the normal color. Now it might be that I just need to use a little bit more body oil and work on it for a couple of years and then it'll turn out as gorgeous as these other pieces. But uh, that's it on Argolite. Thank you very much for stopping in.